All right, so the last type of hydrolyzable lipid we're going to talk about here are called phospholipids. So phospholipids have a phosphorus, which is where the phospho part comes in. And they're very similar to the triacylglycerols in that they have that glycerol backbone. And except in this case, there's only going to be two of the fatty acid components. And then the third component down here is going to be a phosphate attached to an alcohol. So um, phospholipids are the general class of, of this. And then phosphoacylglycerols are the ones that have these two um, fatty acids attached to them. And the phosphoacylglycerols are also going to be the primary component of cell membranes. So once we talk about the phospholipids and these phosphoacylglycerols specifically, we're also going to talk a little bit about cell membranes and how these phospholipids kind of play a role in those. Um, so again, they're very similar to triacylglycerol, except that this bottom part is what we're going to call a phosphodiester bond. Um, so a phosphodiester bond is something you should learn because it's going to come up again whenever we talk about nucleic acids. So if you remember, an ester is when you have a C double bonded to O, bonded to O, bonded to a C on both sides, right? So that's going to be an ester linkage. Now a phosphodiester basically takes that carbon, um, that carbonyl carbon, and it's going to replace it with a P. So instead of a carbon, it has a P. And then a diester basically means instead of it only going in one direction, now it's going to go in both directions. So now instead of the carbon being directly attached to the C, now it's going to be an oxygen over to a C. So ignore that bond there too. And now you have a phosphodiester. So it's a lot clearer to look at just the part that I have in the box, but I was just trying to explain why it's called a phosphodiester. But basically, you have a P double bonded to O with O's going on either side. So if you think of it as a phosphate, if you remember, a phosphate is a PO4, right? PO4, 3 minus was kind of the polyatomic ion phosphate that you had to learn. So here's the PO4. And the only thing that is any different is the charge. And it's only there's only, only a negative one charge here because two of the other charges, right, would basically had been on these other oxygens there and there, but they don't have negative charges because those extra electrons that were there are used in the in the formation of the bonds that connected to the rest of the molecule. Um, okay, so there are two main types of phosphoacylglycerols that differ in this R group, this R group down here in particular. So you don't need to memorize these. I just want to point them out to you and kind of look at a couple of the properties of them. So cephalin and lecithin are two of the primary um, phospholipids that form our cell membranes. And the only difference in them is really in this kind of what we call the polar head group. So you may have actually heard of um, in like a biology class at some point when they talk about a cell membrane, you may have seen it drawn kind of like this, like a, a bilayer, right, that looks like this. And people would describe this as the polar head group, polar head group, and then uh, nonpolar tails in the middle. So polar head group there and there, and then your nonpolar tail groups would be there and there. Um, the polar head group is going to be this part, or in lecithin, this part. Um, to a large, you probably, I probably could have also included this if I wanted to. It's not a, a concrete area where it's kind of formed. But in general, that's going to be the polar head group, and then the nonpolar tails are going to be these R groups here. Let me, I'll pick a different color. Right, so that would be the nonpolar tail groups in these R groups. And the part that's not in any circle where that glycerol backbone in, that's kind of, kind of uh, in between the two. I would say, if anything, that's more in the polar head group as well. But the specifics of this polar head group are that in cephalin and lecithin, there's two, um, both of them have a CH2, CH2, and then they have an amine, right? And in cephalin, it's just an NH3, and in lecithin, it's an N that has three CH3s attached to it. 
But the main thing I want to point out about this is the fact that both of them have an N that has a plus on them. So remember, nitrogens in general have three bonds, so it's going to be N, like NH3, and then it would have a lone pair. But amines are bases, so they can grab an extra, an H, for instance. So in this case, instead of thinking it as um, NH3 with a lone pair, it's going to be an NH3 that's attached to, in this case, a CH2, and then another CH2, and so on and so forth. So that's kind of what that structure looks like. Whenever that nitrogen does have that fourth bond, it has a positive charge. Um, and the same thing happens over here in lecithin. In this case, it's a nitrogen, and then it has CH, basically all of the H's that I have drawn on that structure that I drew, would have CH3's everywhere, and then um, the CH2, CH2 attached to it. So anytime you do have a nitrogen that has the four bonds, it's going to have a positive charge. That positive charge fits into the polar head group because, well, things that are charged are going to also kind of are polar. Um, so again, phosphoacylglycerols have a glycerol backbone, two fatty acids attached to them, and then this polar head group as shown here in the cephalin and the lecithin. Um, and here is that uh, structure that I just tried to draw myself with the polar head group and the nonpolar tails. So I basically already described this on the previous slide. Those nonpolar tail groups are primarily like parallel to each other and attached to that polar head group. And that leads us to talking about um, the cell membrane. So the cell is going to be the basic unit of all living organisms. And the cell membrane is the region that kind of surrounds the cytoplasm. So the cytoplasm is kind of the aqueous or the liquid medium inside of the cell. And the membrane is going to be the region that surrounds it. All right. So you kind of have to, it's almost like the fence that surrounds the cell. So that um, membrane acts as a barrier, just like a fence is a barrier. And it stops the passage of things into and out of the cell. And we call it a selectively permeable membrane. So selectively permeable membrane. And what we mean by selectively permeable is allows some things to go in and out, but not others. So it basically is like a gate, and it can decide what's going to come in and what's going to come out depending on um, what nutrients need to move. And there's certain ways, you know, particular nutrients can move across that membrane through the help of other proteins and things that are in the membrane as well, which we'll look at coming up. Um, all right, so when you have a phospholipid and you just mix phospholipids with water, they immediately form a bilayer all by themselves. In other words, if you just took some lipids and threw them in water, the result would be this lipid bilayer that forms where the nonpolar tails, which are going to be kind of the stringy parts here in the middle, let me go away from green, um, where the stringy parts in the middle all line up with each other. And that's kind of the whole idea of like dissolves like. In this case, nothing's being dissolved, but those nonpolar tails like to be around other nonpolar tails. They kind of go together with their friends and they form that bilayer. And the polar head groups line up on the outside and the inside of the membrane. Um, and that's the idea of forming this bilayer. So cell membranes are going to be composed of these bilayers. And they're also composed of a lot of other things. So here you're looking at a membrane. You can see the lipid bilayer like we just looked at on the previous slide. And there's other parts to it as well. You can see here we have integral proteins. So integral proteins span the length of the membrane. In other words, part of the integral protein is on the outer side of the cell, which is up here. And the other part is on the inner side. Now, a peripheral protein, which is here, Right, a peripheral protein basically just attaches to the membrane but does not go all the way through. It's kind of embedded, as you see there. So the peripheral protein is kind of like embedded in the membrane, but it doesn't go all the way through like an integral protein would do. Um, you also, in a cell membrane, are going to have cholesterol molecules, um, particularly if you're looking at mammalian cell membranes. Bacterial cells actually do not have cholesterol in them or they at least have very, very low levels of cholesterol. But mammalian cell membranes do have cholesterol in them, which you can kind of see with these um, 
these arrows here to the yellow things that kind of embedded in the membrane. And the last thing on here are carbohydrates. So these carbohydrates are sugars, and these sugars can be attached to proteins, like these integral proteins. They can be attached to lipids, so you could have um, lipids that are modified by sugars, and that's kind of what uh, this one over here is like. You can see it kind of the, the um, sugars attached to one of the lipid molecules, it looks like. So the one thing about the sugars, whenever they attach, those are always found on the outer end of the cell. So you can imagine if you have a simplified version of a bilayer like that, and this is going to be outside the cell, this is going to be inside the cell, and you might have proteins that go all the way through, you might have some that go partly through. Anytime you have a sugar, like attached to a lipid, it's always going to be on the outer part of a cell. All right, so proteins and cholesterols are embedded. Peripheral proteins are going to be embedded with only one side in the membrane, where integral proteins go all the way through. And then carbohydrates can attach to the exterior of the cell, the outer part of the cell, and form glycolipids or glycoproteins. So in other words, again, that prefix glyco means sugar, so sugar lipids or sugar proteins. Um, mentioned that a membrane can kind of act as a gate, right, in terms of being uh, selectively permeable to molecules. Well, some molecules can move across the membrane all by themselves. So small nonpolar molecules, O2, oxygen, or CO2, carbon dioxide, those can diffuse through the membrane all by themselves. Both of those are considered very small molecules. They're also nonpolar molecules. So small nonpolar molecules can transfer through the membrane all by themselves. This act of diffusion means they're moving from a region of high concentration to low concentration, so they always move down their concentration gradient. Um, larger molecules or polar mo molecules or larger and polar molecules need help to cross the membrane. This help comes in the form of what we call facilitated transport. So facilitated transport means that there's kind of some type of mechanism, and usually it involves other proteins to help them cross the membrane. So some ions, like the chloride ion or the bicarbonate ion, that HCO3-, minus, they travel through the membrane through these channels, which are made by integral proteins. Um, and other ions, shown as the sodium, potassium, and calcium ions, they can actually move against their concentration gradient. So anytime something moves against their concentration gradient, that's when we, we refer to that as active transport. So facilitated transport moves down a concentration gradient. Down concentration. What this means is that they're going to move from a high concentration, from high too low. Whereas active transport are moving against their concentration gradient means they're moving from low concentration, from low concentration to high concentration. And things don't like to go from low concentration to high concentration. It's much easier for them to move down their concentration gradient, which is why these particular ions require what we call active transport. All right, so simple diffusion is when you have the small nonpolar molecules. Small nonpolar molecules can undergo simple diffusion where they just move through the membrane. And the reason they have to be small and nonpolar is um, small so they can kind of fit through the membrane and nonpolar so that they can kind of get along with those nonpolar tail groups that it has to move through to move inside the cell. Um, facilitated transport is the next one. So the facilitated transport moves from a high concentration to a lower concentration, and it moves with the help of a protein. So again, it's moving from, say, a concentration of three purple spheres to where one purple sphere is, so it's moving down a concentration gradient with the help of a protein. And then the last one here is going to be the active transport, so the active transport 
notice in this case it's moving up, it's moving this way. So this is moving from a low concentration where you have one blue sphere up to where you have five. So it's moving in the non-favorable direction. And in this case, you need an input of energy in order to drive that process. That energy input is usually in the form of ATP of some sort, or sometimes it can be coupled with um, something moving down its concentration gradients. In other words, one ion could undergo facilitated transport where it moves down its concentration gradient. And because that's moving in a favorable direction, that can actually give off a little bit of energy, which can help push something else against its concentration gradient, as we see there in the active transport.